This is episode 639 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, um, you know, even as we are less than two months out from the presidential election, there is still quite a bit going on that is much more policy related than election related here right. in the land of enchantment. Yeah, you uh there there certainly is. Uh we just uh unfortunately with recent history we kind of ignore the presidential election uh as do those that uh buy campaign ads and just figure it's in the bag for the democrat whoever that is. But we do have some real races but you're not hearing as much about those as it seems like as you say policy issues of various types. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest one starting out is that uh, the governor's latest, uh, I believe her fourth education secretary, public education department secretary, Arsenio Romero, has departed. Uh, we talked about this uh, a bit last week and kind of the apparent conflict of personalities with the governor and her desire that he exclusively uh, focus on his public education department duties, not working to become the next president of uh, of New Mexico State University, your alma mater. Uh, but some interesting kind of uh, related material of that is that the uh, the education uh, secretary, so the governor's education secretary, now has written an op-ed in the Albuquerque Journal. And, you know, these op-eds, uh, typically uh, a lot of people write op-eds and you're just like, okay, uh, whatever. Uh, but in this case, it's the uh, title, NMSU must have the right leader, not just any leader, from Stephanie Rodriguez, secretary of the higher ed department. And she really uh, lays out, not, I don't know, you're an alumni, but I assume you haven't been uh, really following the ins and outs of this uh, search. But the university has apparently been through quite the challenge, quite the process to find a new secretary. And uh, they've, I guess, gone through this twice now where they've had a pool of candidates and hadn't necessarily come up with one. Uh, I guess they're kind of in round two. They've got five candidates that they are working uh, with right now, including Arsenio Romero. Uh, the upshot is that the governor's uh, education secretary, first and foremost, they don't really have much of a responsibility. In fact, I'm looking at UNM's uh, manual for appointing the president of the university, which I'm assuming NMSU has similar rules in place. But the policy is the Board of Regents is responsible for selecting and appointing president of the university. Well, Rodriguez and by extension the governor seem to think that they uh, should have a seat at the table here because uh, without going into all the ins and outs of her article, she basically says that uh, because of its STEM focus and uh, more scientific uh, you know, aspects, NMSU should find somebody who uh, checks the box of having that STEM background. Uh, she makes it very clear uh, multiple times in this article that the person should, that the pool should include Hispanic candidates, which she, you're really translating this. They want a Hispanic or a minority. They want a woman. They want somebody who checks some boxes over here. And uh, I guess the NMSU Board of Regents, some of many of whom were appointed by this governor are having issues finding those people, those kinds of people who have both a STEM background and uh, are of a minority background uh, and or possibly a woman, which I don't know if a woman alone, you know, a white lady satisfies what the governor's looking for, but uh, just a very bizarre and fascinating article. This appeared in the Albuquerque Journal on Sunday. Yes, uh, Paul, it is a weird, it's weird. That's a weird article. And, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing that was in that article that has been uh, talked about for really every president since I was there, I was there when uh, Gerald, Gerald Thomas was president, is uh, 
a, an ag background because it is an agricultural school. It's a land grant school. Having said that, the number of ag students, it's a man, it's that college is way, way, way smaller than it used to be back in the day for a lot of reasons. One is that uh, agriculture, a lot less smaller farms, a lot less jobs in that area. But um, I think you could say they are taking it seriously because even though they've struggled, if they've gone through a couple of uh, a slate of candidates and are on the second one and haven't selected the president, maybe they know this. Maybe they want to get the right leader and are doing what's necessary to get it. But this is a this is a strange one in indeed, and um, I don't know. Maybe uh, what? Why an op ed? I could see a phone call. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like hey. Uh, cabinet secretary of ed might, uh, might know my name, yeah. uh, might talk bad about your school and not get you as much allocation of funds in the upcoming legislative right. session if you don't listen to me. But it's, it's a very weird one that they're telling them their job, uh, when in fact you could say that they are looking for the right candidate at a minimum, the fact that they've gone on for a while. The other issue that may, uh, exist is, uh, I don't know. Maybe New Mexico is not a great place to come for uh, the people that uh, that fill all of these boxes for whatever reason. I know uh, school systems and states come and go with regard to a president. I, I knew of one president that for he was scared politically uh, things might happen and chose to leave uh, to leave a major school in New Mexico years ago. And maybe they're uh, a little. Uh, concerned with what's going on with the state as to whether there is too much uh, politics in it. And then the other thing is, is is a president of a university important? I tend to think it is, Paul. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, is uh, why can't they find somebody? It's like, what's wrong with us? Why can't, why, why doesn't somebody who's good want to be president of New Mexico State the amazing Aggies. And the uh, one point I will definitely, you mentioned it, but it's like, hey, state has, they call it STEM now, but you know, it's engineering, it's math. They also have a very strong business school as well. So people get degrees and things that bring value out in the workplace. And so that's very important for the state of New Mexico and for the students. They're not, they're not getting degrees that are, are not helping them with their, uh, lifetime employability and uh you know contributing to society becoming a part of the workforce these are all important things but you know why an op-ed mm -hmm. uh those of us who've worked in communications off and on know that you know they'll take almost everything just because they'll take one doesn't mean that that was wise to write it and i do think that um i find my, my i found myself reading that both saying, yeah, I think you're right. Most of the time you were, you know, it's like, I'm certainly, it's like, okay, I guess have a Hispanic and a woman in there. Uh, what about our native American brethren? There's plenty of those that went to New Mexico state, mm -hmm. no shout outs to them. But the key is, is yeah, you want somebody who might be good at managing an institution that has a uh, science, technology, engineering, and, and the like, that might be a good thing. And, uh, Come on, Aggies, let's get a let's get a let's get a president in there. But hey, if uh, they uh, need another round and this current slate of candidates isn't the right one, then you know go for slate number three. And then the final point about the article: as important as this uh, position is, we're doing fine with the interim, so no need to rush. So that was right. a little bit strange in and of itself. So. Well, of course, the interim is named Monica Torres. Oh, oh, so, uh, oh she maybe checks that's at, why. <laughs> she checks at least a couple of the boxes uh, as outlined there, and uh, it seems that perhaps that is the uh, subtext there. But I agree with you uh, 100%. It's not only a bizarre article on the substance, it's a bizarre approach. Uh, you know, we write op-eds at, at the Rio Grande Foundation because we are ultimately outsiders in New Mexico in this process. 
not on this specific issue, but if in the general. Rio Grande Foundation could allocate uh, state funds, you right. wouldn't write nearly as many. <laughs> you exactly. wouldn't write nearly as many op eds, would you? Yeah, exactly. If I had uh, you know the power of essentially the governor uh, behind me, uh, I would spend a lot less time writing opinion pieces. Now, uh, you know there would be a difference between. Uh, if I was a governor like Oa Gary Johnson with a hostile legislature versus this governor with what what at least she started with was a friendly legislature, I think. Only recently hostile. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, there have been some changes to that relationship. But this isn't the legislature. These are the Board of Regents who, uh, again, I, I don't know all the ins and outs, but as of six years in power, the governor's certainly been able to shape this board of regents. And, you know, what are, what are the relative merits? Is, is it the STEM background? I, I question, you know, I'm a believer that being, for example, at the K-12 level, being a teacher is not the same skill set as being a principal. So just because you have a background in STEM that doesn't mean you're going to be a good administrator of an institution, even if it comes from it has a STEM focus. Uh, so I'm I'm not very convinced of that, just as an argument. Yeah, the the best salesperson doesn't make the best sales manager. Right. I mean that's that is a almost a truism in business. So I totally agree with you. Now, should they should they be a uh, I don't know. A French poetry major who can't. <laughs> oh, those poor French poetry. I know. Majors. I pick on them who uh, you know who can't do basic algebra. Maybe a little bit beyond that, and maybe some exposure. But yeah, do they need to be a scientist as opposed to maybe an administrator that's done this sort of things? Uh, recruited faculty. I know uh, research universities. They do a lot of grant funding with the feds and others to get funding for various. Uh, technical programs and i would certainly think you'd want a background in that for a a place like new mexico state but yeah just a a very very strange very strange and uh yes if the uh person who got the highest uh score on the act was always the best manager the best executive the world would be a, a much easier place yeah and certainly i understand why um uh... You know, she would want, uh, in, in today's day and age, uh, a minority candidate of some kind. But, uh, you know, you've got to balance that out with the, eh, and then that gets back to Arsenio Romero, uh, which that, that doesn't seem to be the point here because they mentioned the lot, lack of minority candidates and he's one of the five finalists. There, ergo, he is the Hispanic candidate among the final five it doesn't and for some reason we don't want him i think yeah. is the message so yeah, it doesn't seem like they're making the big push for uh for mr romero so funny interesting stuff just uh you know th there's uh an old saying that personnel is policy and uh with this governor especially it seems like they have a very odd approach to the way uh they put their personnel into place. Uh, speaking of personnel, uh, because this, I would say, is uh, right up there in terms of uh, important news, uh, I, I cannot confirm, but I went back and looked, and uh, I believe Rob Black, uh, who was named this week as Governor's Economic Development Secretary, uh, he is the only guest on Tipping Point New Mexico to be a part of the Michelle Lujan Grisham administration, which uh, Rob Black is the, uh, well, soon to be former head, if not already the former head of the New Mexico Chamber of Commerce, formerly known as the Association of Commerce and Industry, or ACI. Uh, for you want to go back, uh, Rob appeared on episode 280 of Tipping Point New Mexico. So, uh, I, I, you know, also uh, in line with our uh, vice president and current presidential candidate Kamala Harris's fascination with Venn diagrams. She loves to talk about them and electric school buses. If you draw draw a Venn diagram of plausible candidates for economic development secretary, uh, that the Rio Grande Foundation and Michelle Lujan Grisham would both 
at least be willing to consider. Rob Black may be the one and only occupant of that, uh, of both circles there. Uh, so I find it very interesting now. The governor has obviously moved a little bit towards the center on crime related issues. She got roundly rejected by the left wing of her party uh, in the legislature. She's essentially a lame duck as we speak today. And, uh, you know, Rob Black uh, is, you know, he's opposed uh, as head of the uh, uh, New Mexico chamber, several of her worst policies, including uh, paid family leave, uh, as we saw narrowly defeated in the last legislative session. It'll be interesting to see how Rob uh, manages this role and if this represents some kind of maybe a shift to a little bit more reasonable economic policy in the next two years with this governor. I, we can hope, right? Yes, we can hope. And I was thinking about that is, uh, first of all, Rob's been accompanying the governor on her international mm -hmm. uh, business trip. So uh, they've certainly uh, had an opportunity to visit on several long plane rides, I am sure. And uh, that may have something to do with it. And then, you know, Rob certainly knows business people. It sometimes seems like we uh, hire state bureaucrats that they would, they've never, they've never met or talked to a, biz a business owner or somebody who's a business developer or something. So he certainly uh, checks that mark. Uh, you know, I don't know, Rob, uh, I don't think he's that old of a guy as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'd have to figure this would only be a two year gig in all likelihood. So, uh, you know, but he figures maybe uh, it's a it's a good it could be a good two year for him uh, professionally two years well spent, but then again what is the policy we do so we've been uh, focusing on importing technology manufacturing companies to take advantage of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, money and other things and. A lot of those have fallen on a bit of hard times, you know, with Maxion being the most recent poster child that's almost <laughs> uh, almost certain to go on the Eclipse Aviation spaceport in terms of, uh, whoa, was that maybe a mistake? So we'll see what happens. And Rob also uh, is very familiar with the, all the industries of New Mexico, including the uh, folks in the oil and gas industry. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I wish him well. Uh, it's one of those, sometimes people get appointed uh, to these positions and you just scratch your head and you say, how did that happen? Look at this on paper. I, you know, I think he, uh, he, could, be he could do a very good job uh, in this position. But as you kind of alluded to, what is the job he's going to be asked to do? Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, I would say that at this point, uh, Rob, is going to have to, uh, and obviously the election is going to be a determining factor here in terms of the numbers. Uh, we saw in the primary election back in June, uh, the progressives saw even further, made even further inroads in terms of dominating New Mexico's political situation as the legislature is concerned. If the Republicans pick up some seats in the House, and maybe one or two in the Senate uh, to nullify those gains by the progressives, uh, we we could see uh, maybe the you know pushing aside of the paid family leave, but it's going to require, I think, five uh, Republican pickups to even really put that in, in, kind of off the table or something. I, I'm confident it'll be pushed again, but. Well, yeah, and uh, given the fact that, boy, if you're a Democrat and you vote against that, we know what's going to happen. You don't have to guess. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going to run somebody against you in the uh, next uh, primary election and try to get you out and try to get a progressive in there. And that's been, uh, you know, that's been a theme that, you know, as and there was a podcast we talked about, it, unfortunately, pretty successfully accomplished yet again uh, the two years ago for the last election. So yes, uh, what happens with things, with things like that, or is this just more, you know, or is, are we just going to focus on recruiting, you know, 
It's the difference between, uh, in baseball, they call it small ball or swinging for the fences. Are we going to try to swing for the fences and get somebody in here that's a big manufacturing, add a lot of jobs? Or are we going to look at, uh, while we're recruiting companies and recruiting businesses, look at the underlying factors that keep New Mexico from being as a, an attractive place to do business as it could be? Yeah, and uh, of course we would be remiss if we didn't mention the gross receipts tax as an economic development obstacle. Uh, Rob is abundantly familiar uh, in his you know, statewide chamber, supported uh, needed gross receipts tax reforms in the legislature that the governor did say she supported, but perhaps uh, that is something that would take on a greater priority in uh, the next two years. And we can hope, uh, we can also understand that this legislature is not uh, just inclined to support that kind of uh, economic development activity and you know really get behind those kinds of difficult reforms. Uh, but perhaps Mr. Black can, uh, can move the needle on that. And uh, that would be certainly very nice to see. So uh, speaking of economic development, and uh, guess what, Rob, we have bad news for you if you're listening to this particular show. Uh, the governor and her Maxion solar deal, uh, as you mentioned, Maxion uh, struggling at the you know, financial and stock market level. Uh, there's opinion post article that highlights this issue, but um, Maxion suffered a, a blow, uh, another blow in terms of its stock plummeting. Uh, opinion post cites a nine cent per share price, nine cents per share, uh, while as I sit here right now, despite the market being up quite dramatically as we record this on Monday morning, Maxion is closer to eight cents a share. Uh, they're, thankfully, they're on the NASDAQ for them, not on the uh, New York Stock Exchange like, this, uh, like Virgin Galactic. So I think the rules for listing on NASDAQ are somewhat different. But at eight cents a share and down you know, more than 99% from highs just a, f a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to get into all the ins and outs, but Maxion certainly does not seem to be in any position to, uh, you know, to build a very large uh, production facility outside of Albuquerque. And uh, I would be stunned if they, they do that. And of course, uh, while the, the presidential election remains a very fluid uh, situation. I do believe that uh, President Trump is looking better with each day that passes and as more information comes out about Kamala Harris and her personality and track record, uh, those solar-friendly policies may uh, not be long for this world. And uh, I think that might be the death blow for Maxion if I was to uh, handicap things like like you just said. Well, yes, and you know, to be clear, uh, between the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act passed by Congress, the amount of money that is available for things like this right now is at an all time high. And if you can't get it done in this environment of subsidies and tax breaks and the like, uh, you know, I don't think either candidate probably will be able to afford to put a a few more trillion dollars towards this effort that uh, mm -hmm. particularly if it is gone nowhere with uh, a lot of the industries that we've tried, because uh, it is interesting. It's a little, it's almost like uh, education policy in New Mexico. Money alone does not always solve these problems. You know, you need supply chains, you need workforces. The market has to be there. The timing has to be there and the party has to be there to pull it all together. And there's a lot of things that happen have to happen to make this go right. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, um, other related uh, news on the, uh, I guess you could call it an economic development issue, although I don't think uh, that would really, uh, we'll call it a government spending issue. Uh, the governor was very excited uh, this past week when she got to travel down, down to Las Cruces for the groundbreaking of the taxpayer-financed 
uh, abortion clinic that is going into Las Cruces as a means of providing abortions and other services for uh, predominantly Texans. Of course, Southern New Mexico uh, will be able to uh, take advantage of this uh, taxpayer-financed entity, but it's widely reported, and the governor said as much uh, before this thing was you know, funded through the capital outlay process a few years back, that uh, this was in part to make abortion accessible to folks out of Texas. So uh, kind of like the, the pot uh, shops going up along the border, this is the uh, abortion equivalent, except at least marijuana uh, doesn't require government subsidies by and large. Uh, this one is a $10 million abortion clinic. So uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I'll just say it, a lot of excitement among the very uh, hard left pro-abortion crowd uh, candidates. Uh, the Democratic Party establishment, and of course the governor. Well, let me be uh, let me be uh, overly charitable and say that okay, if this is a a focus on a important healthcare issue, you know we've talked a lot about the problems with the healthcare system, delivery system, number of doctors, and a lot of other things. Is that it's like uh, maybe we could put a little more effort into that as well, uh, because guess what? That's not just affecting people in El Paso and in West Texas who need to come here. That's affecting the uh, 2 million people who live in New Mexico. Uh, th this is our home. So, uh, you know, let's get excited about that. Uh, if, uh, and if we've proven it's like, oh, we can do this, maybe we can uh, recruit a few more neurologists, a few more OBGYNs for prenatal care, you know, more surgeons, all the... Uh, dermatologists, all the specialties that are in short supply uh, causing problems in New Mexico. Yeah, and uh, just as a quick aside, we received a public records request. The, the amount stated uh, that was spent by the media in terms of the campaign, the ad campaign to attract pro-abortion doctors to New Mexico was $400,000. Well. Uh, it's only $400,000 in the most charitable interpretation of the actual number, which at least as it's, as we received was $499,967.27, uh, which in my world uh, is much closer to $500,000, again, of our tax dollars being used to advertise for you know what amounts to uh, abortion doctors and the like coming to New Mexico to uh, you know, practice at this particular clinic or elsewhere. So, Paul, as I learned in eighth grade math, there are differing, differing rounding protocols. Uh, <sighs> it just, there are, and there are some where you truncate. But believe me, that's not the most popular one, and that's not used in this circumstance. It's usually if you're, if you're a dollar over uh, you know, 50% into the next round of numbers, you round up, not down, and it didn't sound like they did that. No, no. Uh, big surprise there. Uh, now, something that uh, Rio Grande Foundation uh, specifically has worked on is, you know, with all of this talk about crime and issues facing New Mexico and especially our largest city here, Albuquerque, re revolving around crime, uh, there's a lot of heat, justifiably so, on Mayor Keller, uh, his police chief. There's obviously the governor uh, and the legislature. We believe that the judges d require a little bit more of uh, being under the microscope. And uh, one judge in particular caught our eye. Uh, she is indeed up for a retention election, meaning that she has to get 57% of the vote and it's not a vote against any other judge or judicial candidate. It's essentially running to say, I'm worth 57% of you, the voters, approving her staying on uh, as a judge on the bench. Uh, this judge is Cindy Leos. And uh, I'm just going to give a few quick points from recent news stories. Uh, one. Uh, 
was where a, a 19 year old Jonathan Rosales was arrested, uh, along with a few other people. Uh, it, the APD uh, sergeant was on Manal where these people were. They heard gunshots and followed the teens in a car. Uh, one of them apparently started shooting at the officer. Uh, Judge Leos released Rosales, saying evidence that Rosales was the one actually firing the gun is low, and he has no criminal history. Uh, so that's that's one incident. There's another uh, of a Arthur Ruiz uh, arrested, uh, accused of sexually assaulting two of his daughter's friends, 12 and 13, giving them alcohol during a June 6 sleepover at his South Broadway home. Uh, Judge. Rios, Leos, uh, at a September 22nd hearing, rejected a prosecutor's request to hold Ruiz in jail pending trial. Uh, and then there is uh, the Judicial Performance Evaluation Commission. Now, this is a group that tends to be the rubber stamp of the judges. This is like asking your loving mother to uh, weigh in on uh Asking Wally's mom, is Wally a good boy? And it's like, he's a good boy. You know, and they, they, Paul, this group, they yep. almost never see a judge that they don't like. And so yep. if they have less than glowing things to say, I think we probably ought to pay attention. Yeah. And this is what they say about uh, Judge Cindy Leos. Uh, says that the scores were somewhat mixed. Uh, and then... They say that uh, attorneys and resource staff rated, and this is quoting, Judge Cindy Leo somewhat lower for not always treating all participate, participants equally and for not always displaying fairness and impartiality toward each side of the case. Attorneys also gave her somewhat lower ratings for not always conducting herself in a manner free from impropriety or the appearance of impropriety. Lastly, resource staff felt that Judge Leo's does not always behave in a manner that encourages respect for the courts. Uh, that is, you don't even have to read between the lines. You just can read the text. But uh, from this group, especially, this is damning uh, information. And, uh, you know, people call, uh, and I welcome their calls when election season goes uh is going on uh, and they get these ballots and they look at the judge candidates and they wonder who is worth retaining, who is worth uh, not retaining. And again, uh, this is a retention election for judge Leos. I think it's safe to say uh, this is somebody that voters need to have a long, hard uh, look at before they vote to retain her. Yeah. Because uh, if, uh, if she is retained, sometimes that means uh, we could talking we could be talking about her her uh, career on the bench ten, twenty, thirty years into the future. So uh, this is a this is an interestingly early opportunity, and very, very, very few judges are ever voted to not be retained uh, to the point where, as you say, it's very tough to come up with the information and. Uh, by all appearances, there, as you say, there's things to consider with regard to this retention uh, vote coming up. Yeah, and um, there is no specifically crime-oriented interest group or version of the Rio Grande Foundation that is uh, putting this information out there. Uh, we could, you know, say all the judges, this, that, and the other. Uh, yes, no, maybe so, uh, but I think it makes a lot more sense to just focus on one uh, egregious example. And uh, Grover Norquist always talks about, you know, it, it's not that you have to come after every single individual who acts poorly. It's you get that one scalp on the wall and you hang it there as a symbol for the others who hopefully will straighten up and fly right. And I, I think it's safe to say that uh, whatever your thoughts are on bail reform, uh, if we had judges that were more responsible and locked up more of the criminals, we wouldn't have necessarily such a problem with bail reform. We wouldn't have some, such a problem with crime in New Mexico and in Albuquerque. Yeah. It's, it's cascading accountability. And so if, uh, uh, and just uh, to take away from this case, if somebody is 
the worst judge and everybody knows it and they are not voted to be retained. Uh, I know there's a layer of three or four other judges that uh, now would be in the role of potentially being the worst judge uh, actually could bring some accountability uh, to them for this. And uh, it's interesting. Judges uh, are, they have a, they have a hugely important role in the ju- uh, in the judicial system. And, uh, but once they get in there, and even if they start to uh, behave poorly, it seems like they're a very, very difficult. Uh, those problems are extremely difficult to address. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, uh, recent reports uh, from Reuters: Volvo has, uh, of course, they are a Swedish automotive company. They have abandoned, uh, become the latest, I should say, auto manufacturer to abandon their twenty thirty. EV only targets that they were all only going to manufacture electric vehicles by just 2030. That's obviously, uh, you know, basically five and a half years, five and a quarter years away. So uh, it's an indicator that the uh, transition is not going as well as Michelle Lujan Grisham would like it to be going. Because Volvo would like to be in business in five years, and every auto manufacturer that doesn't have a death wish is starting to uh, come to their senses with regard to, uh, you know, in anything, the, the, by this year, by the 2030, 2035, 2040, any of those uh, that don't have a, a, road, a roadmap to get there and a reasonable path are just window dressing that are going to have to be adjusted. And uh, we are seeing a lot of adjustment in the car business, that's for sure. I uh, discovered a chart. Sometimes you put things together, sometimes you discover them, but I discovered a chart online. Uh, looks like it's from an outfit called Collaborators Research and Writing. Uh, they put together a very useful infographic uh, showing the highest poverty rates by U.S. state. And they did it a little differently than you often see. The Census Bureau compiles data on an annual basis. Uh, This particular chart is a 2020, 2021, and 2022 uh, chart. And it happens to indicate that at 18.2%, New Mexico has the nation's highest poverty rate. That is the highest in the entire country right here in New Mexico. Uh, You can look at neighboring states, uh, Texas 13.7%, Arizona 12.1%, Colorado 8.5%, Oklahoma 15.8%, Utah at 7.1% is the lowest poverty state in the entire nation. Uh, We, in this particular version, uh, beat out, if you will, Mississippi by four-tenths of a percentage point uh, there at 17.8% and second highest. So uh, this chart, uh, I went and looked and saw if anybody else had put this up on any uh, social media or other outlets. And uh, as it turned out, a lot of people were retweeting this and sending this around. And um, I was very happy to be able to kind of uncover this information and highlight the fact that at least if you use the three-year average from those recent years, uh, New Mexico actually does have the very highest poverty rate in the entire country at a time when we have this massive oil and gas surplus and the money that comes with it. um, Unfortunately, that money is not being used to improve New Mexico's, you know, New Mexicans' lives. Yeah, and Paul, one thing uh, that I noticed on the infographic is I'd, it'd, been a, it'd been a while since I looked at this, but just what does poverty mean? For one person, it's, uh, you only have to make $14,881 to not be in this poverty statistic. So, uh, you know, in a place like Albuquerque and New Mexico, uh, Boy, you cannot buy very much rent, food and groceries and transportation, even if it's a free bus service around Albuquerque for that amount of money. So that this is a, and then the other thing these uh, st- uh, these studies typically don't do is this is based on 
pre-taxable income uh, doesn't always include government transfer payments. But the, the point to that is, is that almost everybody in that 18% is probably getting some form of a government subsidy of either their health care, food stamps, housing, other things. And it just shows how important it is to have a uh, private economy that gets uh, gets our workers trained uh, and educated well and creates an environment that where businesses have uh, have the ability and desire to hire them. Uh, yeah, and uh, briefly, I had the chance to travel to Rio Doso. I mentioned it last uh, week on the show. Uh, in, great group of people, as always, down in Rio Doso. It's one of the uh, conservative bastions of the state. And, you know, it's always uh, tragic and frustrating when people uh, lose their homes and livelihoods to uh, these kinds of uh, for- forces that, you know, in, in the case of these fires, we know, at least from the FBI, one of them were lit by a uh, human being. Um, I talked to folks down in Rio Doso, and they believe that uh, the lightning strike was not really responsible, that uh, there was actually uh, all of these fires lit intentionally, uh, but in you know, kind of a similar situation to uh, Donald Trump moving his head and avoiding uh, assassination so the bullet only hit his ear uh, a change in direction, uh, you know, in, in almost a godlike way, changed uh, that that wind direction and saved the town. Um, people are getting frustrated with FEMA as they are in northern New Mexico. Uh, of course, you're not going to hear as much about that. Um, I think for the foreseeable future, partially just uh, you know, people see Rio Doso as a wealthy group of Texans and uh, not northern New Mexico in the same vein, uh, sympathetic with both groups. But I think that uh, one will achieve much more media coverage than the other. That's just a fact of life in New Mexico. Uh, I think all the people are going to rebuild, maybe not all of them, but uh, because some people did lose their houses and lost their views of the beautiful hills and mountains. Uh, Thankfully, uh, and I did take some pictures. You can go to Errors of Enchantment and find those pictures. It's not quite like a lot of the scenes you often see of devastation from the fires. Uh, yes, these areas burned, at least the areas I was able to see uh, near the Swiss Chalet Inn, which if you come to Rio Doso via, uh, you know, via Albuquerque, you see that is a uh, completely destroyed facility. But there are trees still standing and maybe uh, hopefully many of those trees are able to recover we'll just see how it all shakes out otherwise there's going to be a lot of dead dead wood standing trees there in Rudo. so uh, it's going to take time of course this doesn't happen quickly nature does not heal herself so quickly uh, and then finally uh, there's concern about getting the debris out of the water ra- waterways uh, that is helping to cause the flooding because if those rivers and streams do not uh, do not flow efficiently, uh, you have a lot of debris in them, that helps to exacerbate the flooding issue, which is one of the big things that happened very quickly after the fires is we got monsoon rains and uh, the flooding situation rapidly became the biggest problem facing Rudo. So I'm told by folks down there that... Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is actually in charge of cleaning some of that debris out or cleaning those waterways out. Uh, don't know all the ins and outs of that, but that's what I was told. And uh, uh, they are frustrated and eagerly awaiting action by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to uh, clean out the debris, the you know, dead wood, whatnot, in some of those waterways. Yeah, and uh, Paul, the only thing I will I will add is that uh, based on the experience in northern New Mexico, uh, if you're holding your breath for FEMA to get in there and do something, you better have mighty big lungs because that has proven to be a uh, organization not up to the task for which they uh, ostensibly have been uh, dedicated to, and so. 
you know, northern New Mexico, Rio Doso, uh, you're probably not going to uh, die of heat stroke with 120 degrees or probably not going to get uh, 50 degrees below zero. But believe me, uh, you know, once something goes on two, three, four years with no, uh, with no assistance of any kind, you have to almost figure that that was uh, more trouble than it was worth. And so uh, hopefully they, they will accelerate in both those places of New Mexico. Yeah. So uh, we will see. Uh, we will try to always, of course, update folks on both areas of our state because, unfortunately, um, safe to say that the federal government does not do this very effectively. And uh, Nella Domenici, as part of her campaign, floated the idea of essentially the state taking on a lot of this financial burden, especially with the oil and gas surplus that they have, and then becoming kind of a fiduciary, fiduciary so that uh, they could pay out to uh, property owners under the federal rules and then work through the federal process, get the money, and then that would restore New Mexico uh, from a financial perspective. But uh, that would require some innovation and uh, leadership in, uh, I think, New Mexico, the U.S. Senate, et cetera. But uh, we will leave it there. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.